Good morning, everyone. My name is Joseph Bednarek, and I have been a member here at Quimper Unitarian Universalist Fellowship since 1999. And I have the great honor of speaking with you this morning. I would like to welcome you to this online service of Quimper Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, which is a loving, spirited, and ever more inclusive congregation. And while our physical sanctuary is in Port Townsend, Washington, the sanctuary of our values, principles, are found in the hearts and minds of people throughout the region and throughout the country and around the world. We are so glad that you're here with us this morning. And I'd like to begin this service by acknowledging that the water, the land, and the shoreline here in Port Townsend are the traditional territory of the Sklalem and Chemicum peoples. We honor and acknowledge our indigenous members and neighbors, and we vow to help restore and sustain these homelands and home waters. Uh, if you live in, near, or uh, by Port Townsend, uh, we invite you to walk the Chichmahan Trail, uh, and that will provide you an opportunity to learn some of the rich indigenous history of this area. In a moment, we are going to be lighting our chalice, but first let's settle our minds and let's calm our hearts with the ringing of the chime. Our call to community this morning is I will heal thee with words from the Carmina Gedelica, number 446, slightly edited, with music by Katie Taylor. Enjoy. Please join me on the refrain. I will heal thee, and Mary will heal with me. Mary and Michael and Bridget be with me, all three. I will heal thee, and Mary will heal with me. Mary and Michael and Bridget be with me, all three. Thy strength, thy sickness be upon the earth, holes upon the gray stones of the earth that have firmest bones. I will heal thee, Mary will heal with me. Mary and Michael and Bridget be with me, all three. I will heal thee, and Mary will heal with me. Mary and Michael and Bridget be with me, all three. Be upon the birds of sky, be upon the wasps of knolls, upon the whales of the sea, who have swiftest body. I will heal thee, Mary will heal with me. Mary and Michael and Bridget, be with me, all three. I will heal thee, Mary will heal with me. Mary and Michael and Bridget, be with me, all three. Be upon the clouds of sky that are prone as to rain. Upon the streams of rivers whirling to the wave. I will heal thee, Mary will heal with me. Mary and Michael and Bridget be with me, all three. I will heal thee, Mary will heal with me. Mary and Michael and Bridget be with me, all three. Thank you, Katie, and thank you very much for investing your musical talents to help make these services gorgeous. Appreciate it. Uh, it's now time for our chalice lighting ritual. Uh, please join me and our worship associate, Susan Pratt, as we light the chalice with the words from the 
great Helen Keller. Faith is the strength by which a shattered world shall emerge into light. Faith is the strength by which a shattered world shall emerge into light. And our opening words this morning are by a person you are probably familiar with, a man named Barack Obama, who as a child actually attended Sunday school at the First Unitarian Church in Honolulu. Here are a dozen words that the world would do well to begin practicing. It's important to make sure that we're talking with each other in a way that heals, not in a way that wounds. And one thing that I absolutely love about that statement is he's saying that he's talking with, not talking to. Very important distinction. I'd now like to welcome Bo Olgren, our Director of Family Ministry, who will share our time for all ages. My favorite part of the service, Bo. Good morning, everyone. Last week we talked about grief, and today we couple that with healing. This is another one of my favorite stories from the Loss Library I have here at QUF that deals with grief and healing. Word of preparation, this time this is a story from the perspective of a child whose parent has died. This is One Wave at a Time by Holly Thompson, illustrated by Ashley Crowley. We used to be four, mom, dad, Ben, and me. But now we are three, mom, Ben, and me. Sadness comes and goes in waves. There are places where dad used to be, at the table for dinner, on the sofa napping, on the stoop with his guitar, in the car next to mom, on the sidelines at games, or waiting with Ben. When sad waves roll in too many too fast, I dive under my bed with a flashlight, a pile of comics, and dad's green shirt. Down there, it's a submarine, quiet and safe beneath stormy waves. Along with sad waves come mad waves, towering and strong, cresting like tsunamis and crashing ashore. Ben throws his toys. Mom yells at the ceiling. I wreck Dad's guitar. Some waves are fear waves that cur curl me in a ball. Will Mom? Did Dad? Could I have? Should I have not? Fear waves leave fear stones that make my stomach ache. Some days, there are no waves, just flatness. I'm like a robot as I ride the bus, walk the halls, sit at my desk. Voices seem far. My body is slow, and the world is away. Happy waves, too, slip in to tickle and tackle. When mom smiles or my team scores a goal or when I play boats with Ben, some happy waves stay a while. Others rush away. Waves of all kinds tumble in one after another in no special order, unpredictable as the sea. Waves barely there, waves I can ride, waves that break and crash. But lately we join other families tumbled by waves. In groups we talk and play, and when the question ball asks, what do you miss? I say, my dad's songs and the way he sang them, slow and full of blues. We talk about death what it is and how it happens. Our talking stick traveling the circle as we share how our special person died. Strangers become friends, friends help strangers. In groups, we ride the waves. Sometimes we talk about dad, say things we never said, ask things we never asked, or we hold hands, sing lean on me, even Ben joining in, or we're quiet, just breathing together, mom, Ben, and me. At home, we make some changes. Move furniture, hang memory flags, fix dad's guitar. I fill a grief first aid kit with things that soothe, putty, soft cloth, smooth stones. And we add to memory boxes, dad's guitar picks, shells, funny jokes he told. One day, we rescue a chair from the trash, clean it up, paint it fresh. So now on special days when people visit, we eat dad foods, sing dad songs, tell dad stories, 
and share dad memories in the memory chair. When mom cries now, I don't hide. When Ben whines now, I don't usually yell. And when I spy a wave, I inhale slow. The waves still come. Sad waves, mad waves, flat waves, and fear waves. But when they roll in, I surf them, one wave at a time. Thank you, Bo. What we'd like to do now is acknowledge and welcome those of you who are visiting us this morning. You are invited to say hello in the comments section. Tell us your name and where you're from. The chat section can be found below or on the right side of the video when it is out of full screen, and we would love to hear from you. We also hope you'll join us for our virtual coffee hour in our Fellowship Hall Zoom room. If you don't have that link, it will be posted in the chat section at the end of the service. And if you should find this service useful or inspirational, hopefully both, please share the link with your friends and family. So welcome everyone. We're so glad you're with us today. Now we will receive the offering. Today our collection will go to Olympic Angels. Michael D'Alessandro will tell us more about this organization. Hello, I'm Michael D'Alessandro, Executive Director of Olympic Angels. Angels provides community support for those experiencing foster care on the Olympic Peninsula through the Love Box and Dare to Dream programs. When introducing ourselves and the work we do, we often start with our why. So I'll go ahead and share a bit about my why. I came to Olympic Angels because I believe strongly in compassionate support for kids and families in our community. And the mission hit a chord with me. Parenting has been difficult for the last year or more, but being a foster parent has been infinitely more difficult, and the support many of you have given these families is immense. Like you at QUUF, we believe in community of compassion. As you may know, our biggest expense comes through the delivery of the Love Box and Dare to Dream programs, and we work outside the boundaries of the state foster care system to empower volunteers to deliver support to kids and families most in need. Love Box and Dare to Dream puts trained volunteers around foster caregiving families and youth, providing them what they need when they need it. These volunteers are vital. A well-supported home means a foster family can keep their doors open and manage the hardships of care. A well-supported youth means they have a consistent mentor helping them through life's challenges. We do two things and try to do them really well. Your donation will help our case managers recruit vet, train, and match volunteers in our two programs with youth and families that need that support. By putting a consistent adult in the lives of children experiencing foster care, we can radically change their outcomes for the better. Thank you for all you do to empower community and hope. If you'd like to donate today, you have three options. You may text the amount you'd like to give to the number now showing at the bottom of the screen. Go to our website, quuuf.org, and click on the giving link, or simply mail a check to QUUF. Just remember to write Olympic Angels in the memo line. We will now gratefully receive your offering as we listen to Pat Rogers, who will play Sarah Bond by Elizabeth E. Sidor.
Thank you, Pat. Now is the time for announcements. Due to the increase of COVID cases in our county, the QUUF Safety and Risk Management Committee have made the decision to close the facility until further notice. For those entering the fellowship on business, we ask that you sign in and show your proof of vaccination at the front table in the foyer. Masks are still required. We thank you for your understanding. We will now share our joys and sorrows, recognizing that our personal joys and sorrows are only a fragment of the joys and sorrows of the larger community of life. And thus, we place this first stone, thinking in particular of the continuing work of the Congressional Committee, which is investigating the January 6 attack on the Capitol building. And now, within our congregation, we light a candle of joy for Elaine and Gary Nelson, who celebrated their 45th anniversary on December 29th. Given that Elaine is recovering from a vertebral compression fracture, and Gary is recovering from a second degree burn on his foot, they celebrated with a meal train dinner in the comfort of their own home. And in appreciation for all the delicious meals and other kinds of help that members of QUUF have been giving them, they decided to take the money they would have spent going out to dinner on their anniversary and make a donation to the Habitat for Humanity East Jefferson County project, building five homes for five families in five months. And we have a birthday to celebrate today. Jess Schumacher's birthday was January 3rd. Many of us have been worried about Jess because she hasn't been around lately or have been responsive to emails and voice messages, so we did not get to celebrate with her. Although the nature of her absence is confidential, Kate Lohr thought this might be a good time to let you know that Jess is okay. She's going through some important healing and needs us to honor her process. So Jess, if you're watching, know that we love you, miss you, and eagerly anticipate your return. And now we place a final stone, holding in our hearts the joys and sorrows I've just shared, but also thinking of such joys and sorrows among us that are unexpressed, but of no less importance. I invite you now into a moment of silence. The reading this morning is by the great American poet, Ellen Bass. Uh, Ellen has actually stood in this pulpit to share her poems, and she actually delivered a sermon here several years ago. Uh, and there was even an Alps class uh, dedicated to Ellen's poetry. Uh, Ellen was actually planning to come back to speak here at QUUF, uh, the place that she calls Poetry Church, um, but a global pandemic had other plans. The title of this poem, which you may have uh, heard before, is called The Thing Is. The thing is, 
to love life, to love it even when you have no stomach for it, and everything you've held dear crumbles like burnt paper in your hands, your throat filled with the silt of it. When grief sits with you, its tropical heat thickening the air, heavy as water, more fit for gills than lungs, when grief weighs you down like your own flesh, only more of it, in obesity of grief, you think, how can a body withstand this? Then you hold life like a face between your palms, a plain face, no charming smile, no violet eyes, and you say, yes, I will take you, I will love you again. Rarely have I been so unsettled uh, and yet so inspired about a sermon than I am with this one. Um, the title is a seemingly straightforward question. How do you heal? This is one of the most profound, equalizing, and existential questions that we can face as a human being. And as we move forward this morning, let us honor the likelihood that within this virtual sanctuary, there are those who are healthy, there are those who are hurting, there are those who are healing, and there are those who are trying, perhaps desperately, to heal. And if we're honest with ourselves, uh, we are each and all likely some combination of these. So to the question at hand, how do you heal? Now upon reflection, this question is actually two questions. How do you heal? And how do you heal? 
The first, a broad, almost universal question, and the second, very, very specific, grounded in your experience, rooted in your body, in your mind, and your spirit. Now ask this question to a family or a friend who is currently healthy and prepare to be buoyantly amazed. Ask this question to a loved one who is ill and hurting, newly diagnosed and anxious, and prepare to be, prepare to be, prepare to be entering some of the deepest, richest, and most intimate realms of your relationship. And as part of researching this sermon, I did some field work and I asked the question of family and friends, how do you heal? And each time I asked, the initial response back was, what do you mean? My response back to them, what do you mean, what do you mean? I, uh, I would respond, healing. How do you heal? And like what? My interlocutors would ask, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, healing. Healing the earth, healing the pandemic, society, your credit score, what? What do you mean? What do you want healed? Now I received variations of that response multiple times, which leads me to believe that the idea of healing permeates all facets of our lives, which of course also means that sickness, breakage, disease, imbalance, they're all unavoidable phenomena. We are all familiar, perhaps intimately familiar. All of us, all of us have been hurt and healed in some form or another. And come to think of it, healing may be one of the most deeply spiritual topics that a human being can consider. And not only spiritual, but religious. And consider this from the Christian tradition of the many miracles that Jesus gifted to his community and his disciples recorded in the Gospels, the vast majority involved healing. And while his first recorded miracles didn't deal with healing per se, it is notable that he turned water into wine at a wedding celebration, which in some circles could be considered an act of great healing. And it was not recorded by the scribes whether that specific couple at the water to wine wedding exchanged vows and whether those vows actually included the classic agreement that they would be together for each other, with each other, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death do us part. Now to give you a sense of scale, uh, I'm going to read off in chronological order through the New Testament, the healing miracles of Jesus. Now in this robust account, I am also including instances where Jesus exercised demons as well as raised the dead. Because resurrecting a dead person back to life is the ultimate act of healing, which is the greatest miracle promised in his religion's namesake. It's eternal life. And before we continue, uh, I dutifully bring forward a public service announcement for the fierce atheists and the science-minded humanists and the skeptical agnostics here this morning. Um, the point of voicing this litany is not to prove or to disprove that Jesus was God or to assert that Jesus actually performed miracles or that human beings who lived prior to modern science and modern medicine were dupes. Um, the point here the profound point here is that sick people, since the dawn of time, long to be well. They long to be healed. They want their suffering to end. They want their loved ones return to health. And the desperation to become once again healthy and whole is a driving force in many people's lives. And that someone who can heal another person, well, that healer is a powerful person in the community. There's someone who may be touched with divine powers. And even, even if these events are not provable as historical fact, they happen every minute of every day within the New Testament for billions of believers. They are in fact happening at this very moment 
for billions of believers. This is a miraculous reality that we are called to respect. And so with that preface, Jesus of Nazareth heals an official's son in Galilee, drives out an evil spirit from a man in Capernaum, heals Peter's mother-in-law who is sick with fever, heals many sick and oppressed at evening, cleanses a man with leprosy, heals a centurion's paralyzed servant, heals a paralytic who was let down from a roof, heals a man, man's withered hand on the Sabbath, raises a widow's son from the dead, heals a woman in a crowd with an issue of blood, raises Jairus' daughter back to life, heals two blind men, heals a man who was unable to speak, heals an invalid at Bethsaida, heals many sick as they touch his garment, heals a Gentile woman's demon-possessed daughter, heals a deaf and dumb man, heals a blind man, heals a man born blind by spitting in his eyes, heals a boy with an unclean spirit, heals a blind mute, heals a woman who has been crippled for 18 years, heals a man with dropsy on the Sabbath, cleanses 10 lepers on his way to Jerusalem, raises Lazarus from the dead in Bethany, restores sight in Jericho, heals a servant's severed ear. Now that is an impressive list. Now, you hear the good news about this person walking around town, and you too would begin traveling great distances to witness with your own eyes what is going on. Listen to those verbs, driving out, healing, cleansing, restoring, raising. And the point is that however you frame Christianity in your construction of the religious landscape, the story of Jesus, the story of Jesus' miracles, is deeply rooted in radical healing, in miraculous healing, which is an indication of the religious power of healing, no matter what the religion. One of the central tenets of Buddhism is that life is suffering and that enlightenment is release from suffering. And Taoism has a grand and intricate tradition of health and healing. Yoga practice prayerfully maintains health, all of which points to Gandhi's wisdom statement, quote, it is health that is real wealth and not pieces of gold or silver. And so we return to the question or questions at hand. How do you heal? How do you heal? And in preparing for this sermon, along with interrogating family and friends, I uh, dredged up a quote from memory, and it goes like this. Uh, enough about your injury. Please tell me about your healing. Now, I am fairly confident that this quote comes from the brilliant poet and fiction writer, Jim Harrison. And of course, a storyteller would be interested in the healing because that is where power lies. That is where a profound and personal journey may be taking place, where a human being might just be staring into the void uh, or trying to learn again and again a simple bodily function that they all but ignored when they were healthy, when they were healthy before the accident. Now, in searching for this quote, I scoured many, many Jim Harrison books. I did word searches on his entire poetic canon. I even contacted his family and asked whether they knew where this quote was from, uh, and no dice. So you will have to suffice that uh, my gist of it quote, uh, you'll have to suffice with that until I can actually confirm the words. But the gist of it is, enough about your injury. Please tell me about your healing. And now that said, while looking for that quote, I did find a prose poem uh, by Jim that I would like to share this morning. Uh, it comes from his very last book of poems called Dead Man's Float. Uh, that title's a bit of a premonition because Jim died uh, three months after the book appeared. Um, the poem aligns perfectly with the question, how do you heal? And it also speaks to the religious nature of healing. Uh, the reading is a bit longer than I usually like to use within a sermon, uh, though I believe it will prove very useful. Um, the piece is called, again, it's a prose poem, called Notes on the Sacred Art of Log Sitting. 
And at the time of the composition, a little context here, uh, Harrison was in his mid-70s after a life of assuaging great appetites. He was also suffering from a back injury. He was terribly plagued by shingles. Uh, and by this point in his life, he had consumed an Olympic-sized swimming pool of alcohol. Uh, and if you put all the cigarettes uh, that he ever smoked end-to-end, -end, they would probably circle the earth six or seven times. Uh, he lived until the age of 79, and he died at his desk writing a poem. Uh, and the last words that he wrote on this earth were, God's body with no end punctuation. Uh, and two notes, the name Zilpha is the name of his dog, one of his dogs. Uh, and two, Jim uh, split his time between Montana and Arizona, um, so he had to be very, very mindful of rattlesnakes. Notes on the sacred art of log sitting by Jim Harrison. To give the surgeon a better view of my interior carcass, I was slashed from, ne from neck to tailbone. Recovery was slow, and the chief neurologist told me, you can walk your way out of this. I began walking out by shuffling down a long hallway. It was very hard on my tender empathy to see so many helpless cases, especially the truly beautiful girl who was paralyzed for life. I want to walk in the morning with Zilpha again. I want to walk in the morning with Zilpha again. I want to walk in the morning with Zilpha again. I want to walk in the morning with Zilpha again. I want to walk in the morning with Zilpha again. I want to walk in the morning with Zilpha again. Amen. And I want to bird hunt, which I've done with intensity for 40 years in a row. Is this even possible? Well, the answer, come to find out, was that I couldn't keep up. Zilpha would flush some birds and then look at me to see why I hadn't shot. I was far behind, sitting on an emery oak log and staring hard at the landscape. My shuffling mood was always corrected by sitting on an oak log. So I decided to make some notes on the sacred art of log sitting. Approach the log cautiously with proper reverence as if you were entering a French cathedral or the bedroom of your lover. If it's over 60 degrees, inspect the lower sides of the log for Mojave rattlesnakes. Now, examine the log closely for the most comfortable place to sit, usually away from the sun. Sit down. Empty your mind of everything except what is in front of you, the natural landscape of the canyon. Dismiss or allow to slide away any aspect of your grand or pathetic life. Breathe softly. Avoid a doze. Internalize what you see in the canyon, the oaks and mesquites, the rumpled and grassy earth, hawks flying by, a few songbirds. Stay put for 45 minutes to an hour. When you get up, bow nine times to the log. Three logs a day are generally my maximum. When you get in your car, it will seem as wretched as it is. A horse would be far better. For hours, your mind will still be absorbed in the glory of what you saw rather than mail, emails, cell phones, TV, etc. Hopefully, log sitting will allow you to change the contents of your life. You will introduce yourself as a log sitter rather than a novelist, a detective, or a mortician. You will walk more slowly and perhaps your feet will shuffle like mine. I can readily imagine buying a small ranch that I'd call the log ranch. I'd truck in 33 logs and arrange them on the property like stations of the cross. This could soothe me during my limited time in the 21st century, which has been very coarse indeed, especially after Zilpha died. Now, there is so much here. First, I just love 
the power of that incantatory prayer. I want to walk in the morning with Zilpha again. And of course, there's a double meaning to that word again. Uh, so much longing to return to a beloved activity and a call to pray again, again, again. And then we have that determined patient with a fresh scar running the entire length of his spine. In another poem in the same volume, uh, he writes that the scar, quote, looks like a bite from an ancient creature. And so he's shuffling down a hospital hallway. He's praying hard. He's believing the healer's words that he could walk your way out of this. And the patient shuffles past the door of a room where the, quote, truly beautiful girl was paralyzed for life. Now, in another poem, in the same volume, uh, we find out that this girl's name is Peyton. And Peyton would likely give anything for the ability to shuffle down a hallway. Peyton will be called to a different kind of healing, not walking out of this like the poet. And my guess is that Peyton's mother and Peyton's father, they're in agony over the condition of their daughter. And they would, in a heartbeat, trade their health for their daughters if that exchange were possible, but it is not possible. And thus we return to the question, how do you heal? And so let us imagine that the poet actually went through with his dream and bought a ranch and chucked in 33 logs for the faithful to practice the sacred art of log sitting. Let us imagine that Peyton found out about this place, founded by the poet that she always saw shuffling past the doorway to her room. And she asked to visit the ranch. And she, of course, was welcome anytime, day or night. Now getting to the log ranch, with the help of friends and family, she found her first log, she sat, she followed the notes of the sacred art to the letter. She emptied her mind of everything except what was in front of her, the natural landscape. She breathed softly. She internalized what she saw, oaks and mesquites, rumpled and grassy earth, hawks flying by, a few songbirds. She listened to the songbirds. And many here will recognize that this activity is called living mindfully in the present, which is a profound lesson of many religious practices. And she knew the poet who created this holy place was dead and that she, sitting on this log, was quite alive. And when she was done sitting for the day, she bowed as instructed nine times to the log and when Peyton and her wheelchair were being hoisted back into that van, she introduced herself as a log sitter and she vowed to return to the log grants. She was called to sit on each and every 30, one of those 33 logs. Now to Peyton, this practice and this pilgrimage seemed worthy of a life and she began to pray. I want to sit on an oak log again. I want to sit on an oak log again. I want to sit on an oak log again. I want to sit on an oak log again. I want to sit on an oak log again. Amen. Now may we all find in these difficult and turbulent times where we need to learn to talk with and not to each other. May we all find our hallways and our oak logs. Amen. Our closing song this morning is hymn number 1028, The Fire of Commitment, led by Katie Taylor and Doug Rogers. Amen. Mm -hmm.
about to extinguish the chalice and before we do uh, please know that next Sunday we will be hearing from Kate Kinney with her sermon entitled shall I pay for my speeding ticket I don't know I'll have to come next Sunday and find out and now please join Susan and me for extinguishing the chalice with these words we extinguish this flame but not the light of truth the warmth of community the fire of commitment, or the power of transformation. These we carry in our hearts until we're together again. Fantastic. After the service, you are invited to join us for coffee hour. Um, it is always an interesting opportunity to discuss the sermon to, um, in a facilitated conversation uh, with prompts, uh, you, can be expect, you can expect to be put in a Zoom room, um, and we hope to see you there. But before coffee, let's first turn our attention to Katie Taylor, who will sing the postlude, You Are Perfect. Enjoy. You are perfect, you are whole. You are forgiven, you are innocent, you are healed. You are perfect, you are whole, you are forgiven, you are innocent, you are healed. And so it is. You 
are perfect, you are whole. You are forgiven, you are innocent. You are healed. And so it is, oh, man. And so it is. Forgiven, you are innocent, you are healed, and so it is, oh, oh, oh man, and so it is. So it is